Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming along on, on this beautiful uh, Thursday afternoon um, to, to uh, the City Institute talk, which is part of a broader series of talks on the climate crisis, which are being held by the organized research units at York University. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that the land we are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples. Indeed, Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We also acknowledge the many broken promises and treaties and the need to work towards reconciliation with the original caretakers of Turtle Island, both in the present and for future generations. Let's move on. So let me introduce Professor Laura Taylor from the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change and thank her formally for coming in from her sabbatical to give this talk here to us today. Professor Laura Taylor is interested in nature and environmental politics in urban and regional planning, especially as it pertains to Toronto and the greater Toronto area. Um, much of her research, however, is on exurbia and the environmental and planning impacts of the landscape of large lot country residential homes at the urban rural fringe outside of cities. She's interested in growth management approaches to limit sprawl and conserve nature, such as Toronto's Greater Golden Horseshoe Greenbelt. And increasingly, she's interested in issues of the climate crisis, climate change as the most pressing issue facing cities. Reducing emissions and adapting landscapes to extreme weather have become the focus of her work. And she is indeed here to talk to us today about the role of cities in the climate crisis. So let me hand over to you, Laura. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Linda. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's my privilege to be here today. And uh, so nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, and I really appreciate you taking your time. So uh, I am going to share my screen and uh, take it away from there. You don't have to have your um, video on if you don't want to while I'm sharing it. Um, and there'll be lots of time for questions at the end. Okay, here we go, wish me luck. <laughs> okay, somebody give me a thumbs up. Yeah. You can see that. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was asked to give this talk in the spirit of Climate Change Research Month at York University and uh, for the City Institute, which um, brings together uh, many disciplines across the university to think about issues uh, related to um, being urban. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, cities and the climate crisis, and I'll talk for a, no more than an hour um, and again, please hold your questions till the end and there will be lots of lots of time for that. Uh, so, did you know that 2050 is not just the Paris, target, Paris Agreement target to reduce emissions, which is the United Nations uh, agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to avoid further global warming, but it's also the planning horizon for the Toronto region. As we speak, municipalities in the Toronto region are finalizing their city plans and policies based on the planning principles for complete communities and compact urban form while anticipating uh, electric cars and renewable electricity to heat and cool homes. So I'm cheating a little bit in that the planning horizon is actually 2051, which represents a timeline 30 years in the future uh, where the province of Ontario is requiring its municipalities um, in the 
uh, Greater Golden Horseshoe uh, around uh, Toronto, um, where the province is requiring uh, municipalities to conform to these two plans. So the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the, the Green Belt plan. And we'll uh, talk a little bit about that. So these include every, so municipalities have to think about planning to 2051 and think about everything from housing, roads, how to provide drinking water, uh, how to uh, deal with sewers, transit and nature conservation and everything's being planned with this date in mind. Um, these two plans are the two main provincial plans that all municipalities in the Greater Golden Horseshoe region have to conform to by June of this year in 2022. And um, I'll have another map in a second, but the Greater Golden Horseshoe spans the entire northern edge of Lake Ontario uh, from uh, Niagara Falls in the south uh, all the way around to um, Brighton, which is past Ottawa, up Ottawa, Oshawa, I scared you, didn't I? Uh, Oshawa in the east, and then all the way up to Collingwood on Georgian Bay in the north. Um, so throughout this talk, I'll give you some insight into what municipalities are doing. And this is based on my experience as working as a planner, uh, helping municipalities with these plans, um, especially around climate change. I've thought a lot about the processes that we use and that we follow to make these plans and a lot about the ideologies and values um, that these plans are based upon um, and who stands to gain or lose depending on what kind of trajectories we find ourselves on. Um, I'm using Toronto as an example because that's what I'm familiar with, um, but it really is an excellent example about how cities globally are dealing with all aspects of, of climate change um, and climate action. And I really think that at the end of the day, my goal here is to inspire you uh, to think about how you um, might think about getting involved. So uh, very simply, I think that where and how we live really matters. I've always been very, very interested in how we shape the places and landscapes in which we live and then how after they're built and um, you know, made out of concrete and, and everything else, how those places shape our lives and the kinds of choices that we have or don't have um, going forward. Um, my life has, as an urban planner has been with navigating the assumptions that we make about the spatiality of people's lives. And I'm very aware of how planners um, make assumptions, planners have ideas about how people uh, live and how they should live. And then thinking about how planning, planning practice, processes, policy making, how all of those things are, are um, driven by those assumptions. Um, planning is also very limited because we're not the ones who make the decisions. Planners don't decide. It is uh, elected officials, councillors, um, uh, your member of parliament, uh, those are the folks who make decisions. And of course, there's all of the power structures involved in that, the actors, property owners, and the way that money flows through the economy um, that really affect how, how we live in the kinds of places that we live in. So how we plan matters. Um, and I put this slide up because this is a, a map taken from a 1966 report uh, which is before many of you were born, um, that was one of the first conceptual, conceptualizations of the Toronto area showing how we should think about planning forward with ideas that um, we were growing at a super fast rate, even back in 1966. How do you find places for people to live? Where do we want to put infrastructure? And, and then what are the issues around uh, growth and conservation and all of those things? So, um, this map looks quite familiar to me in that it's showing that there are places that we're going to concentrate where people live, there are going to be urban centers, um, there are going to be highways between them, and um, we're going to try to conserve um, the natural heritage, uh, mostly along the river valleys, um, and creek valleys, and this is really the basis of which the basis. This is a foundation of the landscape that we live in today. And 
um, this is why planning matters because in different, different cities around the world made different decisions back when they were doing their plans, if they were planning back in 1966. And um, there were different ways of, of doing it. It could be incremental growth out from the center. It could be deciding to be completely polycentric and, and really limit um, the growth in one place. And as soon as it kind of gets big enough, completely move to another place. And this is a bit of a hybrid plan, but it's very much informing um, the way we are today. So you'll see that the, it's the goals plan too, which is for the year 2000. Um, so some 40 years into the future. And I really feel that what we're doing now is planning 30 years into our future now, um, but with climate change as perhaps uh, really the most um, pressing thing that we're thinking of. Um, thinking about urban form and settlement patterns deals a lot with what is visible and the imprint on the landscape, um, but really it's what's invisible is what shapes us. Um, the invisible that I'm referring to are the ideologies had, held by actors and groups involved in building and rebuilding cities, and then the processes that we have set up for ourselves to follow to um, help negotiate the, the kinds of places that we want to live in, including legislation, regulations, policies, um, and the practices that go along with those, and then all of the things that we do completely against those and to... Um, and to not follow those and to change them as we go along. So my focus, as Linda said in her very kind introduction to me, um, a lot of my focus in terms of my scholarship has been on thinking about exurbia and the exurbs and people who live beyond the edge of uh, the city or the urban boundary. And they tend to be a bit further away from um, the reach of planning. Uh, depending on which, which cities and places that we're thinking of. Um, and, but the exurbs is why it fascinates me is it's a place with a lot of ideas, ideologies, uh, money, you know, hardship, labor and power struggles, um, thinking about the kind of world that, that we um, want to live in today. So I won't be talking about the exurbs per se, except that the urban edge is really the point at which most of the growth management uh, debates that we are having um, occurs is right at that boundary between the urban and the rural. So question for today, two questions for today, uh, where and how should growth occur in the Toronto region? That's really the big question that folks are, are absolutely seized with across the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And are we planning for climate change? And what difference will they, meaning plans, um, make? So the, the map here is a map taken from the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which I mentioned before. And you can see that it's an idea about um, where to focus growth on with the yellow dots as being urban growth centers, uh, where not to develop, which is the green belt plan in green, and then ideas about how uh, we should move back and forth between those, whether they're highways or uh, high, speed, high speed rail corridors, uh, different priority trans transit corridors, those sorts of things. And so the way that this plan is put forward by the province is saying, here's what we think we should do. Here's where we think that we should invest our money going forward. We have got questions and, you know, as a society here in Ontario and Canada, we're lucky enough to be able to still debate these things. Um, but, uh, and, but municipalities have to conform to this plan uh, um, going forward. So what can we accomplished by 2050. Um, will we build highways? Will we continue to build single family homes for people to live in? Um, what is it that people want? How will, we, how will we work? How will we get around? And so how much is then, this is a plan, but how much is actually within the realm of planning? Um, because as I said, there are so many actors involved in this from property owners, developers, uh, different um, provincial ministries and, and the way the uh, powers uh, change over time, depending on which uh, party is um, the one in power. And then perhaps most importantly, the market, which uh, a friend of mine um, said very famously to me years ago, he said, the market is us. So the market, the kinds of homes we want, the cars we'll buy, 
um, the trends it will take, all of those things are based on us, the market, and what we decide through our individual choices. Um, some people have more, you know, quote unquote, choice than others because they uh, have uh, more money to spend, perhaps, or more flexibility in where they work and who they choose to sell their labor to. Um, and uh, but a lot of us don't have a lot of choice about where to live, and this is where kind of my heart goes in terms of planning and thinking about the the kind of uh, region that we're shaping. Okay, so a uh, little background. Um, the Toronto region is growing. No surprise for anybody who has lived or uh, worked here, gone to school here uh, in the past while. Um, on the left, I kind of have Economics 101, which I'm sure I didn't do very well in back in the day when I took that. Uh, <clears throat> but And then on the right, I have the 2051 forecast for the Greater Golden Horseshoe that the growth plan is based on. So by 2051, the plan is to have 14.9 million people and 7 million jobs uh, um, accommodated, quote unquote, that's the planning language we use, uh, in that growth plan area in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And that's a hell of a lot. We currently have 10 million people and 5 million jobs. This is in, you know, give or take in 2020, 2021, 22, because we're in 2022 now, Laura, thank you. Um, and it's it's half again, and it's, it's an awful lot. Um, and this is debatable. So this is for planning, reasons. It doesn't mean in the sense of a target that if we don't get to 14.9 billion people, we will have failed, but it's what is our responsibility in order to um, accommodate folks going forward. Um, for Canada and Ontario, um, we have a policy of um, encouraging immigration. And the, reasons, the reason why we do that is for economic growth. We want to bring in more people, especially young people, and we want to create jobs for those people um, so that everybody has enough money to spend. And that is really what keeps the economy going. Um, uh, Immigration is very high in Canada or you know, has been uh, over the years and it's expected to remain very high. And uh, most people who move to Canada choose to settle or at least settle first in the Toronto area. Um, we have more young people um, than um, many cities around the world typically have because of immigration and more young people because the more young people we have, young people tend to have babies and then we have more young people. And so in spite of the fact that you may have read or heard, you know, Canada very much does have an aging population. It's a huge issue um, outside of a lot of the urban areas. Um, but for the Toronto region and the Greater Golden Horseshoe, it's, it's not really what we're seized with. We're seized with that challenge of growing. And um, at the bottom of this is that we live in a society that's based on capitalism and capitalist principles. So economic growth is good. Um, every, every choice that the governments, both Canada and Ontario make are because they want economic growth. Again, this is highly debated with a lot of people saying, well, you know, do we need growth in order to uh, prosper? Is this in the best interest of people? Is this going to give us the most livable places? Um, Many people say to me, well, why can't people go elsewhere, right? Why does everybody, you know, one quarter of Canada's population concentrates in this greater golden horseshoe area? Why can't people go anywhere else? And um, uh, people have choice, but they, you know, most of us have to work. Most of us have to live and work still in spite of the pandemic and teleworking and all of that. Uh, we still have to live and live close to where we work, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but uh, this is really the, the basis upon which all of this is. And it is, um, you know, for me, it shows how the capitalist ideas of growth are embedded in everything we do. And it would, and perhaps should take a societal shift for us to change, especially when you think of the um, concerns with climate change. Okay, so growth management in a nutshell, um, kind of alluded to this, 
is that not only do we think about demographics as numbers and forecasts that are uh, not related to anything that's spatial, is that they really are. So we have um, home on, most people live in, in a place that they call home on one hand and have to go or travel to work in a place that is somewhere else. But people also go to school, shopping, um, daycare. You can imagine all the other activities that um, you may go through or other people, uh, friends and family go through. And all of these have very spatial implications. So um, how much land we need, how much space we need for different kinds of things, um, what do we need to plan to get back and forth between these places are, are what makes it spatial. And, and this is what the um, growth plan of people are uh, very much seized with. Um, but this is also what we're up against in terms of thinking about climate change, uh, where and how people live and work, uh, how we make, buy, sell and consume stuff. Um, all of this affects the amount of energy consumed and therefore the emissions produced from that energy. Um, every home, office, factory, warehouse, uh, all of those buildings are on land that could otherwise be used for agriculture, for growing food, uh, for water management, flooding, stormwater management like that, um, for different kinds of nature and vegetation to flourish and, um, you know, greenlands to store carbon. So the um, debate about conservation and development is, is one that's huge and especially um, more critical in terms of thinking about climate change. So I'm assuming that many of you have been introduced to climate change mitigation and climate, ta climate change adaptation as these concepts that are the conceptual framework that we have currently for thinking about climate action. Um, just about every presentation you'll ever hear about um, thinking about planning and geography and climate change and climate action deals with this idea of mitigation on one hand, which is to drastically reduce emissions to prevent global warming and uh, adaptation on the other hand, which is done to ensure that uh, communities are resilient to extreme weather and other changes related to climate change um, and the intersection is I guess that sweet spot that we're all looking towards is that uh, we need to conserve water, think about new energy systems, um, pay attention to local food and the ability to grow local food, think about education and how people understand how their own actions every day uh, influence both mitigation, adaptation, uh, resilience, um, building complete communities, which I'll talk about, and then forest cover or, or Greenland cover. So I'm assuming that this is uh, fairly, um, fairly familiar. Um, at the bottom of this is that um, we will, going forward in the Toronto area, be in a position in 30 years by 2050 where uh, we're expected to have more precipitation and things are supposed to be wetter and things are also supposed to be warmer. So we'll have less snow, more rain and um, many more um, uh, high heat days than um, we have currently. Um, but the big thing is that it's a fluctuation between those things is what makes the real risks of um, climate um, change is because we really have to think about when it's going from super cold to super warm or a lot of rain to no rain. So, you know, places have drought, then you get wildfire risk, P places have too much water, and then you're inundated with flooding. And then those things um, switch quickly and much more quickly with extreme um, weather and climate change. And, and that's um, kind of what we're having to deal with. So cities, cities in the climate crisis, cities are the largest contributors to GHG emissions. And I'm gonna be focusing more on, on that mitigation side of things because that's what a lot of people are talking about these days. Uh, the adaptation side is also very important. I can answer questions about that. Um, but, and a lot of that is dealt with through um, natural heritage system planning um, because we're so lucky to have conservation authorities here in Ontario who have made sure that we don't have to 
worry about a lot of the flooding. But um, so thinking about emissions and emissions reduction and what that does for thinking about growth management and the shape of the region we live in is that um, the vast amount from municipalities here is from buildings and transportation. So therefore the focus on what to do going forward is to um, really think about how to um, reduce the need for natural gas to heat and cool residential commercial and commercial buildings, and then to reduce the use of fossil fuel burning vehicles. And that's how municipalities in Ontario are aiming to meet their climate targets. So we have the 2050 Paris Agreement for Canada saying that we're going to be net zero by 2050 and municipalities, um, many of which in southern Ontario have declared a climate emergency, but are basically also saying, well, we're signing on to also be net zero by uh, 2050. And this is how we're going to go about doing this. Um, so across the Toronto region, greenhouse gas emissions are from buildings and transportation. This is essentially just a, a different way to show it. Um, they vary slightly depending on the different regions. These are the regions, Niagara, Halton, Peel, York, Toronto, and Durham um, of the uh, um, greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Um, showing that you know it varies depending on how much agriculture you still have, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what's interesting to me about this is that um, Canada's commitment when we're thinking about 2050 on a national level is that Canada has to also consider the Alberta oil sands um, where so much of our national emissions are from um, our efforts to get, ironically, to get fossil fuels out of the ground and deliver them uh, to people that want them. And then also nationally, we have to think about large scale agriculture, uh, especially through the prairies um, and uh, in, in Western Ontario too. Uh, these are super important. They very much deserve our attention. But when we're thinking about what municipalities can do and therefore how planning gets involved in thinking about climate change, is that we really are focusing on emissions from transportation and buildings. I put uh, this slide in about electricity to um, highlight that most of the electricity in Ontario is actually already renewable. So most is from uh, produced through nuclear power and a lot is produced through hydro, um, hydroelectric through um, the rivers that we've dammed um, in more than, than one way uh, in the past. And so um, fossil fuels and the fossil fuel production of um, electricity in Ontario is very low compared to other places. So if you're reading the New York Times or you're reading uh, newspapers from the States, keep in mind that in many other cities and many other places, uh, electricity is generated by non-renewables. And depending on, on the place, the more carbon concentrated, uh, like the, the greater the emissions are. So for instance, um, many of the countries in Africa are not really dealing with um, going from natural gas, let's say, to um, electricity. They're needing to go from wood burning to um, electricity or to some other kind of um, renewable source. And um, just really keep that in mind when you're doing your reading and thinking about the kinds of issues that we have here. And of course, neither nuclear power nor hy hydroelectric power are necessarily all good. There's lots of debates about what we should do about that. And um, the real punchline is that people are moving towards wanting to have district energy, which is local, and that that district energy is distributed locally. So rather than having a huge um, grid that um, you know, goes all the way from the Athabasca River down and you know, gives you electricity in your house or from the nuclear power plant um, in uh, um, kind of mid Northern Ontario that delivers electricity is the idea is to have things to be much more local. So when we're talking about local renewables, it's using more solar and wind 
that are uh, closer in the communities in which we live. And that's um, the way that we're really uh, trying to move to. So here's the timeline uh, where I started with to be able to say, okay, where, where are we? Um, you know, here, here the, on the green side is the municipalities in the Greater Golden Horseshoe that are looking um, towards becoming um, uh, net zero by 2050, but also they're planning for their, um, you know, where people should work and live and how they're going to get around by 2051. And then Ontario and Canada has um, also a timeline to be able to get to Canada's greenhouse gas emission reduction target of net zero uh, by 2050. And there are a lot of things going on on the way that don't really have to do with planning, but will help us get there. Um, a lot of the car companies are committing to be um, in, in a position to sell fully electric cars only by, you know, Volvo says they'll be 50% by 2025. Um, most new cars sold in Canada are expected to be electric by 2030. Um, that's the interim Canada's Paris Agreement target is interim by 2030. Ontario's building code is um, set and expected by 2030 to require new buildings to be zero emissions. So um, that will be a requirement and buildings and building envelopes aren't, aren't a subject for planning, but of course buildings is something we consider uh, a lot. Um, it's also 2030 is also the time when um, we're expected to exceed the 1.5 warming. And with the most recent IPCC um, uh, intergovernmental planning, intergovernmental report panel, there's a word panel. Why don't I write this down? Inter IPCC. The, the UN's uh, report on how we're doing we're not doing that great and we're uh, um, exceeding where we wanted to be much earlier than 2030. There's a punchline out of that. Uh, sorry about that. And then by 2040, um, there's an expectation that natural gas for building heating will be discontinued. Of course, it's an estimate, but it's a thing that a lot of people are working towards. And that is, um, and this is for uh, uh, Ontario. It's not um, broadly speaking for Canada or, or speaking for other cities around the world. Um, so this is kind of the timeline that, that we're dealing with and what we're worried about. So, okay, so we have reducing transportation emissions, reducing building emissions, and how are we going about doing that um, through planning? So to reduce transportation emissions, we want to drastically reduce trips by fossil fuel powered vehicles. So one of the big things that we're trying to do is to reduce waste, that the growth plan is um, hoping to achieve through policy and implementation is to reduce the distance between home and work and school, to make public transit a more viable option for people to use more frequently, to make um, walking and cycling viable options, and then to, to diversify regional employment types, which means that um, there won't be a concentration of places that people work as much and that those um, places can perhaps be more um, finely distributed through communities. Um, we want to reduce trips by car for daily activity. So not just commuting, but all the other things that we do. And again, it's um, reducing, reducing distances between destinations, um, diversify and dis distribute centers, like centers where you might go to, whether that's to go to a local coffee shop or to go um, to have a concentration of a school, library, uh, daycare and everything all together. And then to make other forms of quote unquote active transportation possible. And then finally to um, think about and prepare for the phase in of fully electric vehicles and the ways in which our, um, communities have to be ready for that through charging stations and other kind of plug and play opportunities. So um, the land use implications of those, so this, so this is where I started, um, this is what the previous slide was, and then the land use implications are exactly this, that um, we want to um, have all of our things in close proximity to each other um, make employment lands more accessible by transit. Obviously, there's a lot of places with warehousing and distribution buildings and concentrations of office space 
where that are already built. And so we want to make sure those are as accessible by transit as possible. Um, create transit hubs, which is a big part of um, the planning going forward and thinking about the major transit station areas and concentrated growth around those. Um, design roads to prioritize transit and active transportation, which I'm sure you've seen while well, you've been out and about even already, and increase residential densities to reduce land use and shorten distances, um, and then charging stations, as I mentioned. And all of these, they, they seem like they make sense. They're great in terms of the policy context, which, uh, which is kind of next, this planning, planning policy context. We're going to have complete communities with all of these things together, compact urban form, great major transit station areas so people can you know, work, um, work at one end and live at the other uh, end as a destination, uh, a lot of mixed use, and then be ready for new technologies, except the debate about how to do this, uh, where to do this, um, who's going to benefit from it. If it's all new building, then um, the cost per square foot ends up being very high. And do we actually want to have a region, for instance, where people um, who are living in newer areas are you know, living in places where they can um, say that climate action is better, and then uh, a bunch of people are being left behind in existing urban areas in one way or another, and then what happens to those? So that's on the transportation side. And then think about buildings and the built um, uh, urban form. Um, Make new builds net zero is a way to go. Uh, think about retrofitting existing building stock to be energy efficient and, and to use renewable energy. But in order to do that, we have to think about how to accommodate that. Um, whoops. Uh, and then uh, identify locations for district energy hubs and design the infrastructure. So um, district energy is just, well, district energy has been around for an awfully long time but the focus on it now as a way to um, uh, uh, have a way of uh, using, using less, less energy and um, being much more efficient with the energy that we use is um, becoming a, a subject of very, very, very hot debate in terms of development and redevelopment. Um, and then uh, thinking about, of course I had to do it in a different way here, I always try to be cute with things and try to make things fun and then it ends up going a different way, sorry. So the, and then the land use implications of that is that you actually have to have urban growth centers and community uh, centers so that you can have a district energy concentration that actually makes sense. Um, uh, generate renewable energy locally, as I was talking a little bit about before, where you're identifying sites regionally and in cities and in communities um, and even at site level to be able to have renewables, which is also highly debated. Um, not many people want a giant wind turbine in their backyard, et cetera. And so how are we going to do that? And what does that look like? And then um, to plan for the community connections and the distribution networks um, as we go. Um, think about where in rural areas but that are close enough to urban areas that we can actually generate sufficient uh, amounts of renewable energy. Um, and then at the level of the site, as I was saying before, and then think about phasing out heating with natural gas, which a lot of cities are um, expecting to do. So um, again, it's a, the city of Toronto, I think is perhaps really gone first and saying that this is a real goal of theirs. They have a new and very strong policy for what they want to do um, in terms of building retrofits and new buildings by uh, 2050. But it really is a systemic change of rethinking about infrastructure um, that we have in it, and it will be um, turning a very large ship for us to go from um, using natural gas to using renewables. And so um, again, there's the official plan policy part of this, which is to be um, to reduce the use of energy and therefore uh, the emissions produced by that energy, compact urban form, co complete communities, mixed use designations again, and then to really see energy as an issue for planning, which it, which it really hasn't been before, meaning that we have to really think about how we go about um, 
um, accommodating uh, the infrastructure that we need to. So um, this slide and the next two slides are um, quotes from the growth plan itself. And I'm just gonna read you through them because they're really underscoring this planning principle that is, or the two planning principles that are um, shaping the places that uh, you're going to live in if you choose to stay in Toronto and that are shaping um, places like all across the globe because this is in terms of thinking about best practices. So this plan, the growth plan is about accommodating forecasted growth in complete communities. These are communities that are well designed to meet people's needs for daily living throughout an entire lifetime by providing convenient access to an appropriate mix of jobs, local services, public service facilities, and a full range of housing, meaning, no, a full range of housing to accommodate a range of incomes and household sizes, which, which underpinning there is read affordable housing. So this is, this is the goal of the plan is to try to achieve this. And it's a very kind of um, aspirational thing that uh, is um, trying to be done. So, and the quote continues, complete community support quality of life and human health by encouraging the use of active transportation and providing high quality public open space, adequate parkland, opportunities for recreation and access to local and healthy food. So this, this is really the vision. Um, but you can imagine that there's a lot of conflicting goals in there. So uh, how, do, how do you go about doing this? How do you prioritize public open space, for instance, over affordable housing? Um, uh, how do you prioritize affordable housing over having enough room uh, to be able to grow food, enough um, room for agriculture, both within the urban area and outside of it? And then the final part of this quote is, um, they, uh, complete communities, provide for a balance of jobs and housing um, in communities across the Greater Golden Horseshoe to reduce the need for long distance commuting. They also support climate mitigation by increasing the modal share uh, for transit, meaning that more people will take transit than will drive cars, and active transportation by minimizing land consumption through compact built form. And by land consumption, means land that hasn't already built been built on. So when you would go and look today, it would be under agricultural production or uh, it would be fallow and perhaps being um, regenerated uh, by, you know, successional, um, <sighs> successional growth by uh, trees and uh, other kinds of plants. Um, and the, that's what land consumption means. And it's this idea that, you know, the urban area is going and consuming land in order to grow. And to, to limit the amount of land that we have to consume, we would like to build in compact built form, which means to accommodate as many people and as many jobs in the smallest area possible. And that is really what the goal is. Okay, so I'm... Um, in thinking about these, I have two examples. So in complete communities, I'm thinking about uh, the town of Milton, uh, which is the plan that is here before you. And then the next slide will be thinking about um, compact urban form. So this is a plan taken right out of the official plan. So the comprehensive plan for the town of Milton and Milton is a, a town or city uh, to the Northwest of um, the, uh, Toronto in the center of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And it is at the leading edge of growth for the Toronto region. And there's been a, a lot of development recently and a lot of development is coming um, to Milton to help accommodate those people and jobs that we're planning for. And so this is um, a secondary plan, which is part of the comprehensive plan that is showing the the idea about how this place will develop. And it is intended to be a complete community providing residential areas. So people, places for people to live at different densities, um, places for people to live and shop and institutional areas, which is this um, beautiful pink color here, um, which would be a school say, um, uh, business parks, 
uh, these little V's are little village squares. So there's, you know, places where people can go and congregate. There's natural heritage system, all of these things going on, which is intended to be a complete community, but it's still going forward at, you know, a fairly low density. The, the question is, will this be a complete community? Or if you were going to end up living, you know, at the corner of whatever this dairy road and whatever road this is going to be in the future, um, would you actually be able to access all the things you needed to do in your everyday life, going to school, going to work, um, going shopping, going to daycare, you know, doing all those things um, within your community? Or would you feel like you had to get in a car in order to access those larger things? We have an enormous amount of freedom of choice, um, many of us, and uh, there's a lot of places to go. Um, and for those who don't have a freedom of choice, then um, failing to provide a complete community is going to undermine uh, folks' ability to actually be able to thrive, you know, in, in the places that we're building for them. Um, so that's my example and question about complete communities. And then compact urban form. So depending on what you're reading from where, compact urban form means different things to different people. This is uh, part of the image from the cover of the Brampton's 2040 vision. So the city of Brampton, which is also to the Northwest um, of the Toronto area. And this is like a, a highly fantastical picture. And so don't expect to be able to fly in in 2100 and see that it looks exactly like this. But what, what the depiction here is that many people in the future will live in very high densities um, and there'll be the existing kind of existing residential areas. There'll be a lot of land retained for uh, flood uh, water control. Um, but this is really what compact urban form means. So instead of spreading out in single detached homes, um, we're going to build at very high densities. And um, on one hand, it's, it's great because if we can live within the existing urban area, then we don't have to build, um, we don't have to expand the urban area and build onto land that's currently farmed or build onto uh, land that's currently regenerating. Um, and that's a really good thing. So those green lands can be used for carbon sequestration um, and there's a lot of great things going on. But on the other hand, there is a, a fear that I have, frankly, that we're setting ourselves up to live at super high densities, which also doesn't seem to be uh, very livable for everyone. And certainly in a time of climate change, it doesn't really seem to be um, necessarily all that resilient. You know, the city of Toronto has in its plans that every new building has to show that they have backup power for at least two weeks because we experienced, a, we, you know, people in Toronto experienced a blackout um, probably close to about 10 years ago now. And people who were stuck in condo buildings because the uh, elevators weren't moving and they uh, weren't able to get up and down the stairs, there was a real problem. So this, th these are my questions around um, compact urban forum and what we'll do. Um, certainly, this provides more opportunity to have mixed uses and offices and places that people live um, close together, uh, except the assumption that everybody who lives there and everybody who works, everybody who lives there will also work in this place is also questionable because um, we can live in, you know, wherever we want and choose to live uh, wherever we want. Or we can't choose where we want to work because it's the only job available and it means that we actually have to travel outside of our community to get there. So this is what municipalities are getting us ready for, um, but what is actually working against us. So the planning framework, uh, every, you know, planning up until now has been based on fossil fuel settlement patterns and the ways in which we think about uh, the ways that people should live are, are based on these, you know, highly, uh, uh, a lot of high concentration of energy and therefore a lot of emissions from this. So this is 2016 now, so it's five years 
although that pandemic two years just went by like this. This is, this is, I took this five years ago when I was coming in or leaving on an airplane. And um, th these are the brand new suburbs that are being built um, at the edge of Brampton. And so these are single detached ground related, uh, you know, lower density um, homes that are being built. And these, these are brand new. And so it takes a very long time for things to move through the planning approval system. So for us to be able to switch from now until 2050, you know, when will we actually um, see that things are built um, on the ground? And so two of the big challenges going forward, I think uh, this is the first one, which is car dependence. And then the second one is kind of that American dream of the single detached home. So um, this is the uh, province of Ontario's, I was going to say Doug Ford, but I'll say the, the current provincial government's um, proposal for Highway 413 or the GTA West Highway, which is meant to be that next circle of highways beyond Highway 407. So if you think of kind of the 401, the 407, and then the next circle of highways going on, this is Highway 413. Very cleverly, they haven't shown the Eastern version of this, which you can also almost imagine would be the flip side version of this going to the East, whoopsies, um, that would go uh, um, to serve all the way, you know, kind of past Whitby um, at the very least. But so this highway has been on and off and on and off, probably since I became a planner and began to understand what the issues were in the Toronto region. And depending on the um, government that's in power and what their ideologies are, uh, folks are either very uh, car dependent or champions of thinking about cars and wanting to accommodate them, um, or they're uh, not and want to cancel the highway. But you can imagine for planning, this is a huge issue. Are we going to have a highway or not? If we're going to have a highway, that means a super high concentration of um, cars and then all of the areas along the highway will be built as dependent on the highway, won't they? Like the, because that's kind of what we've ended up doing in the past. So this is taking that same highway 413 um, and as it would connect through part of the city of Brampton, this area is called Heritage Heights and it's a secondary planning area that they're working on. And this um, big purple line that's going from north to south will connect part of the 410 and 413. And you can imagine for this community, is it going to be a um, main street? which you could argue is this a main street, but this is, a, this is meant to be a place in the city where you have lots of room for transit, active transportation, um, accessibility to uh, kind of town center, downtown types of uses and a concentration of people, or are you going to have a highway going down the middle of it and then um, it completely you know, blows apart this idea of being able to have a complete community uh, and compact urban form in this place. So that's that's one big example um, thinking going forward. And this is you know the same pr province holding on one hand the idea of complete communities and compact urban form and the need to get to net zero by 2050. And then on the other hand, um, this desire to still serve cars and have um, more room uh, for cars and, and for goods and services movement too. Uh, the, uh, trucks that carry all of the all of the Amazon packages back and forth uh, from the Amazon warehousing centers and distribution centers um, to where people live and work. So the other big challenge going forward is people's desire for a single family home. So many of you are going to school right now because you would like to have shelter, you would like to have food, you would like to be able to take care of yourself and your family and uh, you want a career that will pay you an income so that you can get there. But then what does that shelter look like and what is it that you want and what do you aspire to? And so much of the cultural um, uh, marketing over what the container for a good life is, 
in our world is this idea of a single detached home. And if people can't find one, you know, within the greater golden horseshoe, they'll go beyond it. And as we know, uh, other places much further uh, away from Toronto um, are starting to grow uh, quite a bit because people can't find a single detached home within the Toronto area. And so they're going further and further and further and further and further afield um, to be able to get it. And when I mean further afield, I don't mean just thinking about Guelph or Collingwood. Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we're beyond Barrie in terms of Ontario. I'm thinking about New Brunswick and Nova Scotia where people can go um, if they have a job where they're able to telecommute or if they think that the house is more important than their actual job, because if they can't have the home and ground related and, and this idea about where you should have a family, then they will go to a place where they can have that and then actually try to gain employment in, in something different that's outside of what's offered here. Okay, so um, this is me concluding. There's a couple of kind of conclusion-y slides, which is um, thinking about that uh, we live in an urbanizing and really a suburbanizing world. Um, and how we live and grow and how we make choices about how and where people should live and get around are huge. Uh, cities are the engines of growth and development. So there's a lot of focus by government, governance, um, the, the power elite in thinking about how we want cities to grow and how the, the way that cities grow will benefit the economy huge complex topic I could do a whole hour on thinking about that but but those are really the things but then when you layer on thinking about climate change uh, mitigation which I focused on a lot here and then adaptation um, you know change has to happen here we have to reduce our emissions um, we really have to think about how we're going to make sure that we have enough um, water uh, clean for drinking going forward, and then not too much water through stormwater management going forward. We have to think about our waste and how we use it. Can we use it for, sorry, biofuels uh, going forward? And what are the kinds of socio-technical solutions that we're willing to adopt or perhaps not willing to adopt um, in terms of going forward, um, being um, connected, uh, thinking about electric vehicles, um, thinking about those things that will change our kind of everyday lives and help reduce emissions, but perhaps we might be giving up some other things in order to get them. And then about education. So what do we need to do in terms of education, educating ourselves and educating other people about the impacts of their choices on um, climate change and on the economy and how, they're particip how we are participating in the economy uh, going forward. So if you think of yourself as a resident of the larger urban region, um, you know, what kinds of choices are you actually able to make? And where, what do you want to see though? What choices would you like to be able to make? And then how are those things um, caught up in the kinds of plans and plan making that we're um, involved with? And then to if you don't like it and to, to speak up and become involved. So I put, um, I am a professor. I teach in the faculty of environmental and urban change. And these are just four examples I pulled quickly of students that I've had over the years who have completed their uh, master's degrees and the kinds of things that they have been involved with to think about their own education and how they want to go forward into the world with a planning career, um, but to understand what their, um, what they think their choices are as uh, professionals in, in shaping where people live. A uh, lot of focus on thinking about equity uh, and ensuring that everything that we do really focuses on um, places where people are more vulnerable and don't have choice and where those places intersect with um, where uh, climate impacts are expected uh, to be the greatest. Oh, and then that, <laughs> that is the end. And those are my questions.
uh, those, that is my, oh my gosh, that is my um, talk for you today. And then I'm um, looking forward to your questions. And those are, um, the contact information.